everybody. My name's Joel. My name's Hugh. And we are doing, once again, <laughs> Draft House Games Top 100 Games oh, of time. All Time. Yeah. This is going to be list uh, 30 through 21. Of course, all that stuff that happened before. Hot garbage. Who cares? <laughs> Talking about the real good games now. <laughs> That's right. Uh, do you want to you wanna start off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off? yeah. Uh, my number 30 is probably the most middleweight of middleweight uh, uh, Euro uh, deliver games. It's Istanbul. Uh, Istanbul is a game that comes with 12 tiles, 15 tiles. Right. And you're basically trying to get, uh, depending on how many people are playing, if it's full boat, I think it's six rubies. Uh, that sounds about right. Yeah, and so you're driv- you're driving you're just you're just driving around your pieces, and at, every time you go to a place, you have to leave a you have to leave one of your people behind. Right. And when you're down to just placement, but you're yeah. But driving. when you're down to your last person, uh, you either have to go back to the beginning area that resets everything, or you can go back and pick up one of your own guys. So you can kind of backtrack. So if you can get a good little engine going of where you're going and you're going and picking up guys, uh, there's definitely a strategy to winning the game and never wasting a turn going back to absorb all your guys. Right. So, modular game. uh, When you put the pieces out, they're all at random except for the center. Yes. Um, Bunch of different ways to collect points. But not really point salad because it's not like you're going to accidentally pick up points along the way from random stuff. You kind of have to choose your route early and then there's two or three expansions i do not play normally with the coffee expansion but i do normally play with the letters expansion that one I think sounds it right is. yeah uh but it is that game where you want to take somebody you're playing games with and you want to take them from Catan. Carcassonne, Ticket to Ride, and you want to take them to that next, that next step. Right. Uh, and Istanbul, for me, is that, that gateway game to that next leap. Right. Here's, how, here's how you have to start thinking about, like, your right. games as you're playing. This is where, you okay, you were collecting cards for Ticket to Ride because you were putting out trains. In this one, you have to think further ahead. Right. On your turn. So while other people are going, you should be thinking about what your next turn is going to be. And watching what they're doing. Right. Because that might affect your... Right, because if they go to a place where you were going, then you have to pay them. Right, which may, down the line, come up where you don't have quite enough money now as you were going to two turns after that have to go over some place that required X amount of gold. Right. Yes. Um, I, I talked about this one back at... All the way back at 61... Yeah. Hot garbage, you know? Uh, But yeah, obviously I like this game as well. Uh, I don't have it quite as high. um, Probably because I don't play it. Also, you have to make sure you just play regular Istanbul. Because we did get, we did play Istanbul the Dice Dice game, game. and it was awful. Not a fan of that one. That was a bad game. Um, Didn't feel like it condensed down. (laughs) Uh, Istanbul properly, and yeah. also didn't feel like like it was a good um, uh, like crossover okay. thing. Like Seven Wonders to Seven Wonders Duel, they don't really feel right. like the same game, but you still feel the spirit, and it's a good game. Yeah, I didn't get that out of this one. Right. But yes, Istanbul, not the dice game. Istanbul, yeah. classic board game. Uh, expansions are also right. all decent with it. The the but the core game is just fine. Yeah. But if you want to expand it after you've played it. Ten times because we've I've I've played that game a lot. So having the expansions available is, and I I think once you get the expansion, it all fits in the same box. So my number thirty is Istanbul. All right, my number thirty. I think it's already come up again uh, before, but uh, let's talk minis for a second here. Oh jeez. Simon Games, uh, Eric Lang. Oh. Uh, improving is. upon <laughs> what he started with uh, in in the first uh, Blood Rage. in the in the first game, Blood Rage, uh, putting the uh, uh, Eastern spin on it. Yeah, we're we're talking about uh, uh, Rising Sun again. 
I can't. You didn't have it that far back, I think. But we, we just talked about this. Yeah, it's just yeah, it was just a couple of like ten or twenty back. Um, area control game. Uh, you're, a lot of skirmishing between the people at the table. Uh, backstabbing is kind of a big deal. So a lot of alliances, and then immediately destroying those alliances <laughs> yeah. for quick gains. Um, I really like all the components on this one. Um, the minis obviously are like super standout. They're all very intricate. The big monsters, even the ones that come in the base box, are like really nice. And then there's tons more that you can get in in side boxes and upgrades. Um, it's gonna it's gonna cost mm -hmm. you a pretty penny to get there, but if you if you like this game, it's one that's worth like investing the money into. Um, I like the the playmat is pretty awesome. The, the playmat is pretty awesome. I like the way the the um, player choices are made using those. They look like dominoes. Yeah. And uh, the first person starts out with basically all of them gets to make a choice, and then once that choice is gone, there's two of each one, so the next person can do it. But certain certain choices will disappear as they get around the table to you. Um, <clears throat> uh. We talked about it a bunch before. Yeah. There's not a lot more that I want to say about it. It's a good game if you like area control, um, if you like visually like appealing looking games, um, and you're not too worried about your friendships at the yeah. end of the day. Because um, yeah, it's a very it's a very uh, backstabby when it, game. When it came out, it was probably I'm gonna say top two three nicest looking. Games, yeah, and it's still on the table. Yeah, it's very still high up there. But I mean, I, we 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 have to admit though, as as the years go on for games, production value has it is skyrocketing, stepped up, and yeah, it's starting to skyrocket. So. There, there's another. So well, by the time this one comes out, well, they'll probably be talking about it a bit more. There's another. There's an Egyptian themed yeah, version yeah. that's like the third in this line of games. It mm -hmm. looks like it might even take another step up in production quality right. from some of the minis that we've seen for it um but i mean still look it's not one that's gonna ever look like right terrible in it'll always look good on the on the table uh so that was number 30 yep. number 29 is a game we used to play all the time uh it's dominion <laughs> no because i also still like it uh no worker placement um, that was like leagues above the rest of them it seemed like when we got it um, but has oh, just started to be is. overshadowed like I have a lot of worker placement coming up in the list that could be one of two games um, Lords of Waterdeep Damn, it's water. Lords of Waterdeep um, worker placement collecting cubes to uh, basically just do missions yep. um, it's really like straightforward um, you don't need to know anything about water deep. Yeah. Um, it's just like it's just mechanically very solid. It helps sell the game. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just point collection through um, trading up cubes yeah. throughout the game, which uh, we've talked about a bunch of games like that previously. Right, Gollum, Gollum Century Spice Edition. Road, Splendor. Yeah. Uh, we even just were playing some new ones recently that were decent not probably going to be on these lists anytime soon yeah. but this is like a popular style right now this one was there before most of those were take three different kind of worker cubes and turn it into two better worker cubes <laughs> um and and of course we like you know worker placement just in yeah. general at this table so yeah um it's again it's it's been overshadowed but obviously not by that much because it's still in my top you know 30 of it make my top 100 time. That is surprising. Yeah, I know. It was in my top ten for the longest time. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, because it's still a good yeah. game. It's still just, a good game. There's so many other games out there, and like we've said a million times, I think at this point, this is a top one hundred that right. has to do with a time and place that we made. Right, we could break that out and play it. And yeah, I'd be like, oh man, that yeah. should be in my top one hundred. Yeah. Um, but for me, still twenty nine. Lords Water Deep. All right, my number twenty nine. Is going to be on Joel's list way higher. I think. Unless you already said it. I don't think you said it. My number 29. And I just put it in here as one word because there's multiple versions. I'll say it later, I think. I have a feeling. Clank, a deck building adventure. Uh, so there are, and I'm including Clank 
in space. Clank in space is a different game, but it still has all the same yeah, mechanics. Yeah, the mechanics are all still the same. I mean, if you want the modular board, go with that one. Yeah. Also, just theme wise, like yeah. if you like the fantasy, like going right. into the dungeon and fighting the dragon, you go with Clank. If you right. like the sci fi adventure, you go with Clank in space. But right. Clank, Clank is Clank. Yeah, and then there's I don't know how many maps at this point. Dozens, it feels like. Yeah. They put out a map every couple of months. Usually it's double-sided. Uh, change it up a little bit. That's the adds new... one or two mechanics. Adds a few yeah. cards. The spider one and the dwarf one. The gold gold rush or whatever. Gold, golden, golden silk. Golden. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, golden silk. That was a really good one. Um, but for me, it's one of my favorite deck-building games. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Where... You just you're just building a deck, buying cards, putting them in your deck, and then you're drawing cards. And anytime you you're traversing this thing, the the the, the board. But anytime you have a card, so you have to play all your cards you draw. And if they say clank on them, you're making noise. You're and, making noise and, you're and bothering the whatever the main villain, the, the is big at bad that point. Typically the dragon, yeah. but there's also a few others. A mummy and, and yeah, um, yeah. So. I'll talk about it a bit again at some, yeah. at some point on yeah. some list. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we've talked about this before. Deck builders, great. Deck yeah. builders usually now, Gotta it's have pretty standard else. that you have, you buy cards that are part of your deck and then you fight things. Right. Right? That's like, that's the basic deck builder. So you gotta add one more. Like, you gotta have some mechanic. other mechanism, some other catch. To Typically, get your game. that catch, as it turns out, is movement. And this was the first one uh, yeah. that I remember doing it, uh, and it just did it really well. Nobody else has quite caught up with it for me. And for me, the clank, the thing that works best with clank is the is the clank mechanism. I love the putting the cubes in the bag when you cause the the big bad to come looking right, for and you. He stirs and people you have to draw. Stick your hand in the bag and draw cubes and see who got hurt. And uh, you're getting and, down low on health, and you're like, right. you have to throw in your cubes, but you're on the run. Like, what and do you're you like, do? You're like, they're gonna draw from that bag. I have three health left. Do I have three? Do I have three cubes in that bag? Chances are, I have six <laughs> cubes in that bag at that point. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just works really well. There's also the mechanism of if you think you're not doing so well, you can try to just grab an artifact and make a run for it and try to get back up top, and maybe you might get lucky and kill everybody. Or get, there's a, there's a line, basically, where the dragon will eat you versus where the dragon won't, but you can get yourself, you know, just above the line and right. then try to murder everybody else who's still down in the dungeon. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, fun slash terrible ways that right. you can play out the end of that game. Yeah, it's really good. My number 29, Clank, a deck building. He's going to talk about it later. But Clank, a deck building adventure. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, my number 28, I don't, I don't think I've heard it on your list either. So 28 might be coming up later too. I can't remember. My 28 is my favorite Stonemeyer game, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my number 28 is Scythe. So Scythe. Maybe you already did talk about it. So even though in Scythe it looks like a looks like a army like risk. It looks like, oh, the map, you're gonna put your pieces on the map, you're gonna area control and you're gonna fight. It looks like an area control fighter. It, yeah, yeah. It, it does. It looks like it's gonna be more blood rage. Right. But than, it's not. Than Monopoly. <laughs> right. And it's more gather your resources and kind of defend your resources so people don't come in and attack you and take them or or use them as fast as you can so it doesn't matter if somebody comes in and fights you right. uh and a lot of times there's fighting but you it i think you have to do i can't remember how many fights you have to win to get the star i think it's like two or three fighting is generally all bad in right. that game, that's, except that's, for, except you can get a star because you need right, X amount of stars. You can get a star for fighting, right? If you can do it super early in the game before you've gotten right. yourself any uh, love from the people, but right. basically it looks like a big fighting game, yeah. like it's going to get hectic. And then as it turns out, <laughs> citizens don't want you skirmishing randomly out in the fields over resources. They get angry about it. So you actually, it's more a game about like uh, not necessarily alliances, but handshake deals and 
Uh, I'm not going to come across this line. Trying to gain prosperity without mm. that, like, need for the war. But the different powers for each group of people, for each 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 person gets a different power with their guy, like the guys whose mechs can go into water and come out wherever on the board. Uh, they all have their abilities, if you use them correctly, to win the game. Right. It's also got the sort of cool thing where you're, it's, uh, I wouldn't really call it a worker placement, but you got a you got a block that's basically you're using to choose out of uh, yeah. uh, there's four like sets on a, on a on a player board in front of you of things that you can do. There's a top version and a bottom version, and what you do is you place your piece in a spot, and then you can do those things that right. are there. And then next turn you can't do those things; you have to move to another spot. You're talking or, about this one, right? I did back at like 50, in the fifties. Okay. Um, back on the back on the board. Uh, but everybody's board is modular. A little, so it's, it's a little not modular, different. but yes, it's all they're all yeah. slightly different, right? Yeah. They don't have the same combos of two things yeah. that you can do on them. So everybody and, and they're not set to a specific clan, so you get weird combos out of like the clan powers and right. then the the power you have available or the, the, the abilities you have available. This you. this is my this is my this is my game for the next step after a stamp. <laughs> so if you go from one of those target games to Istanbul and then once somebody can get a grasp on a medium weight game like Istanbul then you can teach them scythe and and one of the things about scythe is it's one of the best the art is one of is some of the best art even though I guess there was like a big thing about him tracing it or whatever yeah, I'll, but, yeah, right. yeah I the, the photo stuff or whatever but I don't care it looks great yeah. it's already out there yeah. it already exists yeah. it's what the game looks like yeah. it's good it looks it fits it's right. very fitting it's very thematic feeling and I don't think there's gonna be ever I don't think there will ever be another expansion for it I think I think he said Rise of Fenris was the the last one I think. yeah I still haven't played that though the legacy version yeah so my number 28 is Scythe um, yeah, again, it was already on my list, so clearly I like it, and it's just not quite as high, uh, so obviously hot garbage and you're wrong, but you know, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, 28, I think you might have already talked about, 28 is, uh, Mechs vs. Minions. Yep. Mechs vs. Minions made by Riot Games, uh, it's based on their, their IP, League of Legends, um, in it, pretty close. Mine was forty three for this, so it's yeah. pretty close. Well, in this one, you're playing a uh, cooperative uh, programming game uh, where you have your mech, and, but what that thing does is based on a player board that you have in front of you, where you slot in cards that you get. There's a hectic moment at the beginning of mm -hmm. every round where cards are dealt out, and then in player order, people uh, take those cards to add to their programming while the timer's running. While the timer is running, so. If you don't, uh, if somebody is, stalls out and can't decide on a card, it screws the rest of the table because they have to then randomly be the same cards. Yeah. Uh, games played in scenarios, there's, uh, I believe, 10 pretty good scenarios right out of the box. Yeah. And then Riot Games has also put out other encounters that you can get online. They don't require anything extra. It's just ways that you set the board up. Right. Um, this game is, as said before, the farthest you will stretch your dollar best bang for your in, buck in a board game like yep. period um you get like a hundred um minis they're all basically the same there's like three variations on them right. but like they're all solid weight they're all uh they're all printed well however they made those yeah. ones the actual character pieces are all painted yeah um big chunky pieces yeah like there's a boss uh, minion in the box that you get to as you progress through the missions. Yeah. Super awesome. Yeah. The boards are all chunky. The pieces are all chunky. Nothing feels like it's going to get damaged. Game uh, trays in it are awesome. Game is super heavy, and it's it's like, it's definitely a game that is $150 from any other company. They charge you 70 Yeah. I think it's 75 Se Sorry, 75 yeah. 75 <laughs> But you, you can go to a store now and, you know, something like... Predator Porter or Museum or that might cost you seventy five dollars. Right, and those games are good. We're not saying there's anything right. like wrong with those, but for like just the actual sheer amount of twice stuff, the amount of stuff. Yes, and, and plus, and plus, if you're looking for a co op game at your table and you don't like Pandemic, yeah. Again, if you don't like that uh, captaining, yeah. right? There is some of that in telling people maybe what cards to take, right? 
Um, but, but you're once you're moving your piece, man, you're on your own. Yeah, yeah. So it's got that ricochet robots, but you're you're <laughs> co-op. You're all working together. So yeah. it's actually you, you hit somebody's you know mech, and you're like, oh, I am yeah. sorry that I just oh. threw you into lava at the end of your <laughs> turn. Oh, I just pushed you into the wall. For the rest of your turn, you're just going to be shooting into the wall. Um, but yeah, great game. They have a few more games that they're working on now. Looking yeah. forward to all those coming out because yeah. they knocked it out of the park. Uh, on their the first, first game. One they did. Yeah. Uh, so that's 28, Mechs vs. Minions. 27, I don't think you've talked about. I do think you will. Bunny Kingdom. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, Bunny Kingdom is a drafting game. With the interesting skin. Yeah. Uh, you're playing on a big board that is uh, just sort of graphed out into squares, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3 on the side. Most cards give you a location, like B3, so I'm going to go to B over here, and I'm going to go down to 3, and I'm going to place a bunny there. So I now I now control that area of the board. I'm trying to make places uh, that are attached to each other. Um, so more bunnies in the area plus more castles and more resources right. in those areas uh points multiply up as you do that so in the first rounds when you've only dropped you know maybe f five to ten bunnies and they aren't necessarily even next to each other you might end up with like, one point but yeah uh as the game goes and you manage to connect these places together and all your resources and pool of stuff start to become attached those mm -hmm. points go up very drastically there's another option, of course, in the game that I should specifically be the one to talk about, and that is uh, collecting artifacts, artifact parchments. cards, parchment cards yeah. uh, that will have artifacts as one of the things they'll have on them, or treasures as yeah, one of treasures. the things they'll have on them. Uh, those are like separate points or points for doing specific things on the board. Um, those stay face down in front of you, so that's really the only right. hidden points in the game. Uh, if you can do math, you can see most people's points on the board, although it gets very uh, hectic very quickly and hard to keep track of there. Especially once you add the, you add the expansion. Yes, uh, there is an expansion now. It adds another section of board, which adds a bunch more cards. Yeah. It adds a bunch more of the uh, parchments that um, <clears throat> mostly have to do with that top board. So you'll at least know when people are working on it. Right, and it adds that second multiplier where when you're collecting up... Uh, different kinds of special resources and their times by something I by can't your remember. Tower. Yeah, by your Tops. towers or whatever. <clears throat> yeah, so it also allows uh, more of the growth on the board to be important again. Yeah. Um, it's just two different aspects of the game that yeah. sort of give you different ways to it's not quite, it doesn't feel like point salady where you're getting points just absolutely anywhere right. um, but it gives you a couple options to work with. Super fun a lot of it though probably has to do with the theme yeah uh instead of just being like warring tribes or whatever you're these you're packs of bunnies out building in fields um and i'll say it richard garfield you've never made a bad game richard garfield <laughs> i haven't played all your games so i'm not i'm not gonna go quite that far but i've played all of them he's, he's, he's got a few on the list um yeah. i think this was originally was supposed to have a different theme or was sort something. of generic yeah and they're like, uh, let's see if we can, you know, if you can find something else to do with it. And I, uh, the gameplay all would have been fine. Like, I'm sure I would oh, have yeah. liked it. But I think that, that one extra thing, the, right, is what sort of puts it on the list. The drawings are very uh, cartoony. Well, very colorful, super very colorful. vibrant. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very, like, whimsical. It seems like it, sh it, seems like it would, should be like a fighting game, like trying right. to take over the territories. Um, but this one, you don't ever feel that. Yeah. Um, there are small bits of interaction where you're sort of hate drafting, but it never feels that right. Um, it never feels that hateful in the game. Right. It's like, like I'm holding two cards, and one of them really doesn't do anything for me. But this card kind of messes you up and doesn't allow you to build a bigger fight. I'm going to take that one. Right. It's not so much hate drafting as this is just the best play. Right. And. Uh, so yeah, it's got that competitive without that without the competitive like feelings right. behind it, which is great. I mean, there's people that just don't like those kinds of games, yeah. and this is kind of lets you slide that game in there where you yeah. get to do the competitive stuff without anybody's feelings getting hurt along right. the way. Um, 
I'm sure we'll get back to it. Maybe not in this list, but at some point here. But for me, number 27, uh, Bunny Kingdom. All right. My number 27 is where the word hot garbage came from. So my number 27 is Endeavor, Age of Sail. So we do say the word hot garbage every once in a while on here. Uh, that became a thing because... Endeavor came out with two different versions. A retail version and a Kickstarter edition. Right, the deluxe edition. Yeah. There was not a huge jump in price, I believe, between no. the two. It was like $20. But the difference... It's just night and day. Yeah. This is where we say if you're going to put out your game, like, and you have an idea of how it should be, just put that best foot yeah. forward. Don't put because, out the crappier retail version. Because if you like this game, there is never a reason to own the retail version, and I would feel bad mm -hmm. if I bought the retail version, really liked this game, and then realized I didn't have. Or had played the other version. Yeah, and then, and then opened the up your box. And, yeah. It's yeah. just. So. I tell them about the game first, and then uh, we'll talk about. I mean, it's it looks like it's going to be a super complicated game. True. It also, when you open up, you think, "Oh my god, this is going to take three hours to play." You can play a game of Endeavor Age of Sail in an hour if everybody knows what they're doing. Uh, so you're literally just m taking a spot on a map, uh, choosing it, and on your turn, you're gonna. Take, a, take the next step from where you are, and you're going to collect up resources. Uh, or you're going to get cards from the side of the board, or uh, the, the group of people when you're playing, they... I mean, you really can't control where you're going, per se. I mean, you get a pick. But, I mean, there's very prime requisite spaces you need to go. Uh, there's black X's on the board, and those black X's are victory points. Right. So, so if you're controlling the outside if, right. of those black X points, yeah. you're getting victory points. Right. So you want to kind of control a path, so at the end of the game, you're going to add up the victory points you have that you're connected to. But it also matters... See, those things will travel through from, from region right. to region, but it also matters that you control... Right. certain regions so you're balancing between like getting control of a region and continuing onward with like your right your so you're either going to take your guy and put him on the side of the board on one of the locations to try and start setting up control and the person who has the most pieces there gets the there's like one uh magistrate card right the captain card yeah whatever, whatever you want to call it it's, it's the card that's a little more powerful than all the other cards uh, and you can only hold five cards. Right. Uh, and one of them can be a slave card, or whatever it's called in the game. Right, you can you can have the slave cards, and those yeah. are sort of, those are strong, but those cards can be wiped out. Their point right. values can disappear. And, uh, but I've never played a game where that's happened. Um, but it's, it's a little point salady, a little bit. But well, there's a lot of places to go. To there's get a lot points. of things you can do. Right. And you don't have to you don't have to consolidate your points into one thing, right? They will easily stack between the two. There's no exponential growth on one right. side over the other, so there's no reason not to grab from multiple pools of like right. points. And so on the beginning of the turn you're, there's a tray, and again it's a sweet tray <laughs> that has these little tiles in it that you're gonna put on your board. You can take X amount of those, one a turn, for the game. That is going to kind of decide what route you're going to take to win the game. Right, yeah. Because the, the, those are your actions. It's going to be, are you going to uh, do a sail action? Are you going to do a ground support action? Or are you going to do a cannon action? Right. Where you're going to be able to shoot somebody else's marker off the board and take their spot. Uh and, and based on what pieces you're taking, uh, and sometimes you can't get out to the far end to get the nicer buildings because you haven't built the correct way, so you're just taking the cheap buildings right. up at the front. Uh, it's, an, it's an ingenious way because I've never played a game of Endeavor where it was the same as the last. I never felt like 
any of the games are repetitive. Yeah. Um, Because there's so much modular ability with the what houses you're picking at the beginning for your movement. Right. Because even if you have a way that you want to play, eventually right. somebody picks up on that, and and, and they will, and they, they will start taking that stuff. Hate and draft. Yeah, it's a fan favorite around here. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's talk about for just a minute here. So here's the thing: Endeavor not on my list. Why is it not on my list? Because I forgot about it on the day that I was <laughs> making this list. Otherwise, it would be in here, and we would probably be talking about it again sometime very soon. Yeah. Um, that's why these lists are, again... At the moment. At the moment. Um, two versions of the game. The nicer version, the one that we have, the only one that we've really played, we've yeah. seen the other one play. the other one. Uh, indented boards, nicer figures, uh, some things are replaced from being, uh, pieces of cardboard to plastic figures. Right. Um, the board itself is the same. Yeah, um, but like your player area, and, but all the and little board, the little things that you pull out of the bag, I believe are like wooden or something, and then the ones in the other one, I think, are cardboard. Yeah, um, little things, but they're all they all feel so much better uh-huh. in use on the board. If you have Endeavor, <laughs> get the deluxe version. Yeah. Or, I mean, if you want Endeavor, get the deluxe yeah. version. I do. I think it's pretty pricey right now. But I think it's Burnside Games or whatever. But part of the reason that it's pricey is because they put out two versions, and I believe they put out less of the deluxe version right. than the regular version. They did the same thing with their last game, too, which is Into the Mountain of the Mountain. You guys are, you guys are bastards. Or whatever. They, they just released a retail version for like 55 bucks, but the deluxe edition is like 125 and see now, and that that's a bit of a difference yeah. too. Like, I mean, now you're talking about some real, but but if it's going to be a difference of like twenty dollars, like yeah, if it's a game people like, you've really done them a disservice by right. giving them the one that was twenty dollars less that they now are gonna spend seventy dollars basically to upgrade that I, twenty dollar. Anytime I'm at a store and somebody's looking at it, I'm always like, that's if that's a retail version, you should try and find the deluxe edition. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that, so my twenty seven is Endeavor Age of Sale. And always have indented boards. Just yeah, there. always. If Last cubes, note on if your moves, if your board, if you bump it, and those little cubes are going to move all over, have indented boards. Uh, uh, right, twenty-seven. Endeavor. Yeah, twenty-six. My twenty-six is probably my number one polyomino game. Well, that's not possible because we're only at number twenty-six, <laughs> and I assume your top ten is half. Tetris, half another game. No, I think this is it. All right. Tell us, tell us about Baron Park. Baron Park. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Baron Park is a, uh, is a light family game is what I consider it. Uh, yep. But it is polyominoes, like we've talked about before. They're like Tetris-like pieces. You're going to do stuff to purchase them. You have a little Baron Park in front of you. One board. As you cover other stuff on your board with your polyominoes, you're going to end up getting more boards. There's an expansion now that will take you from four boards to five boards. That gives you a monorail system that's all 3D. It's really cool. Uh, The game is super simple. I mean, it is a game I could teach anybody. Uh, You're just going to pick pieces on your turn by covering stuff on your board, and if you... By the way, can't cover anything on your board, then you get one of the generic pieces that there are a bunch of. Right. Uh, which covers one or two spaces. Uh, but what you want to do is you want to get the bigger pieces because they're going to cover more of your board. So you're always looking at the polyomino pieces in your board while everybody's going, hoping that they don't take the one piece that is the perfect fit for your board. And they're gonna. <laughs> if you're me, they're just gonna. <laughs> and uh, the game is... The game looks great. It's I mean, you're literally just building a, a bear park. Uh, and with the new one, you get the monorail system, which sits on top of the board, and it makes it look a little 3D-ish. Um, I know we already talked about it on your list, so... Um, it's also hard to get sometimes, I guess. I guess it runs out. It sells out. Um... But if you're going to play one of those games... Now, I have not played Isle of Cats, which I hear is great. So maybe that next year that 
is up here. You're going from bears to cats. All right. Yeah. Uh, but my number 26 is Baron Park. Um, the one thing I'll say on it is, again, it's uh, sort of the same thing with Clank, where we talk about, like, they come out with, like, a new idea, and a bunch of people do it immediately, yeah. And but a lot of times it's just not as good as that first right. one. This this is still probably my favorite uh, polyomino game. Um, and it was one of the first ones where it was like, okay, it's about, you know, Tetrising in on the board again. <clears throat> and a slew of games came out that year doing the same thing, and they were still all fine. Still coming out. They were all fine, but again, Baron Park was just, yeah. just that little extra. Yeah, the more polyomino. All right. Amazing. Well, number Only 26. 26 <laughs> for me. Let's build some decks. No, oh, okay. Let's build a tiny deck, though. Oh. Uh, this is Taverns of Tiefenthal. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a very new game. Uh, it's only been out for a few months as of... Here. Yeah, here, as of uh, as of this video. Yeah. Um, you are running a bar. Uh, you're trying to get the best guests to show up, and you're trying to do that by brewing the best beer. Um, each turn, you will just... You will start drawing cards so it is a deck builder you're adding right. cards to your deck um but your turn is sort of determined by how many people show up and how quickly they show right. up so you just start flipping cards into the spaces on your player board you're filling uh, the table to determine how many yeah to determine how many cards you get to use this turn once your table spaces are all full you're done you're out of places to put people in your bar so you're not bringing anything else in so now you just see what you have available to you to use that turn to uh, buy uh, patrons and uh, other things for your deck. Uh, those things are actually going to go on the top of your deck, so you're going to get them the very next round. Yeah. Most deck builders don't do this right. um, because normally you churn through your deck a few times. This is not a game where you actually churn through your deck. Right. You're basically... Uh, only taking a few new cards each turn because right. you're taking all the stuff that came just prior to that. It's a cool mechanic. That's I I love that mechanic. Um, it's unfortunate. It uses uh, a miniature card deck. Yeah. Um, mini cards. I get stupid fat sausage fingered hands. <laughs> uh, so give me some bigger cards. However, they sit into oh, a board. So the board's gonna have to be bigger. Uh, that that you're making. <laughs> if you did them at full size, you would have a gigantic board, and you'd be right. able to fit like two people around playing this yeah. game. Uh, it's definitely not really a two player game. It's a three four is really yeah. a good Sweet good area spot. to play it with. Um, interesting like mechanics as far as. Uh, as far as a deck builder, right, it's, it doesn't work the same way that most of them do, as I was saying. That gives it something interesting. Um, tavern games, or games, like, themed around taverns are, like, more popular now, I think. Um, so I'm not surprised to see one, but this is the first one that I've thought was, like, that I've personally liked a lot. Of. I haven't played a lot of the other ones, I guess. But uh, this was the first one where I was like, okay, this is cool, and it fits the concept well, and the way it all works. Like Wolfgang Warsh made this game. He's super hit or miss for me. Because he also made The Mind. But everybody else likes that game, except yeah. our table, apparently. Yeah. Don't like that We're game. sorry, it's not much of a game, right. but, um, I mean, you might notice we like slightly larger <laughs> boxes. Yeah. Um, yeah, but no, it, same thing for me, but this is one of the hits, yep. clearly. So, 26, Taverns of Tiefenthal, unless you got anything more to say about it. Nope. Then we're going to 25, which I'm sure you'll have a few things to say about. 25 is the first Crossroads game to come out, and still the best Crossroads game to come out. That is Dead of Winter. Uh, take your pick between Dead of Winter and Dead of Winter Long Night. Yeah, same uh, game. Same game, couple extra mechanics in Long Night doesn't matter to me i'm just putting down you know dead of winter as the whole shebang except i haven't played the, the last thing but we'll talk about that one in a second so zombie game two things are the problem in this game one zombies they will eat you that's so you're trying not to get bit and the other <laughs> is uh it's in the middle of winter so you're trying not to get uh killed by the frostbite uh, expect uh, expects <laughs> by the effects of exposure right um so you're running from place to place, 
uh, trying to collect items, trying to meet an objective. Uh, but every time you do, gotta roll dice. Every time you go somewhere, you gotta roll dice. Those dice uh, have blank space, which means uh, you're free. Nothing happens to you. They also have exposure spaces, which means you take frostbite. There's a snowflake. Which is a snowflake. And then there's the blood spots, the which tooth. is uh, when you get bit. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> each round, there'll be uh, an objective for the round. Collect X amount of uh, gasoline. Collect X amount of uh, additional weapons or right. ammo, whatever. Uh, there's Then you always, of course, need to feed all of your people. So you're trying to collect enough food. Um, it's a co-op game, so everybody's helping each other out, except the other thing that's dangerous. There is <laughs> usually a traitor in your midst. They need to go unnoticed, but are generally trying to thwart your plans along the way. They're maybe not quite as helpful in getting all the gas you need. So that whatever round. your goal is at the ga- at the beginning of the game, you turn over a goal, right? And that's the goal to win the game. Usually for the, you, right? Everybody has well, for to, everybody. Yeah. Well, yeah. And but then everybody has everybody has a personal secret, right? So for you to actually win the game, you need to both make it to the end, yeah, and then have completed your own personal goal. Now, your own personal goal will probably be at odds at least a round or two with it. The general goals of that round. Have four gas tanks in your hand at the end of the game. Right. And this turn, it's like, oh, you need eight (laughs) gas tanks to survive. And it's like, like, "Ah, I got three. I'm so close. Don't do this to me. Um, But, of course, the traitor is like, eh. Um, You can throw fake out cards in Mm -hmm. the pile. So if you're the traitor, you know. You just, oh, I'll dump some food off. So now I have less right. food to feed everybody. Yep. And there's not enough cards to have all the gas tanks we need this round. Um, and then they take those cards at the end at the end of the round, and you shuffle them. Right. And then you turn them over. To, to see if you've completed your game. <laughs> and you can see if somebody, somebody screwed everybody over. Now, the reason that it is called a crossroads game, the specific thing that makes it that, is every round there is a crossroads deck. And uh, the next player at the table will kind of choose your own adventure. Yes, we'll 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 read the card, at least the top part of the card, and know that certain thing that happens will trigger an action to happen uh, that round that will basically get voted on. Usually, one good or and one bad, or one bad and one less bad. But (laughs) they aren't necessarily in the order that you would expect them to be. Sometimes you're trying to do the altruistic thing, and that's actually the bad thing on the Mm -hmm. car. So, uh, short of memorizing them, right, you don't necessarily know. You have a feeling about which one's better than the other. um, Find somebody out in the cold. Do you bring them into the colony to make them warm? And then, oh, they've been bitten. Yeah, yeah. And now they and now everybody's got to roll dice. And so everybody's got to roll dice to turn like into that. zombies. Yeah. Um. So so the crossroads thing is just this random adventure deck, yeah. um, that pops up every couple of turns. Right. Yeah. It's not a guarantee. Like every right. turn, very specific things have to happen for certain cards to go off, and those are also ones that you definitely like won't know, right? Because they're just so rare to see. Um. It's a good game for uh, tables that will talk to each other. Mm. Um, it's not. It is a bit of a social deduction game, but more so, it's just this co-op. Like trying to survive, and it's hard enough even without a uh, traitor sometimes. Um, and then these random side things that happen, where the table has to decide, uh, or at least a majority has to decide what's going to happen based on the crossroads cards. Well, and the paranoia sets in because there's actually a chance when you shuffle in the cards that nobody is the traitor. Right. <laughs> but you always just assume. Right. Somebody's well, the traitor. You gotta assume. Right. Right. Somebody out here, is, <laughs> unless I'm the traitor. Yeah. So I'm always the traitor. You're not helping out enough. You're yeah. a traitor, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of finger pointing. Again... Yeah. Um, but it, but in a co-op setting, right? So it's kind of a fun one to get in there with yeah. the, uh, the the people who don't necessarily like the... Right. It, it's a lot easier for the traitor person to exist in the game, even if you're a new game player. Uh, unlike Spyfall, yeah, where uh, you most, get kind of stuck on the spot if you're the spy. Most social deduction style games, uh, you have to be 
basically good at, at lying yeah. or, or bluffing uh, to get through them. This one uh, is so yeah. secretive about how you do all the stuff um, that it, it it's difficult to right. You can be formulate the, your theory properly against you can, who it is. You can be the traitor and still help out enough that it doesn't appear that you're the traitor. Right. And because everybody else's goals are usually about holding or hoarding or whatever or gathering as many people. Everybody does something that looks, it looks like suspicious. a traitor move. Right. That was suspicious. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's easier to uh, infiltrate, right? right? So there are games that people just won't play because they're like, oh, I can't, I just can't lie. Right. You know, Sheriff of Nottingham doesn't doesn't work so well for you, right? Unless you can work the cards well enough that you can tell the truth the whole time. Right. But this game's never going to give you the cards to let you right. just do it and tell the truth the whole yeah. time and still screw the group. But it also helps you so much in keeping like concealing that identity. Uh, that I t- tend to have a fun time with it. <laughs> Hence why it's number 25. Oh. So, 25, Dead of Winter. 25. Okay, my 25. I was amazed this got as high as it did, but I only played it twice. But it might be my favorite drafting game? Maybe. Uh... Maybe I have one more no. up here. I don't believe you. Uh, but Paper Tales is my 25. Uh, Paper Tales is a... Just like Seven Wonders or Hadara, you're drafting cards and passing them around the table. And you're selecting the four cards that are going to sit in front of you. Two are like the gathering... The, the cards that you're going to use to do stuff. And then the other two cards are your fighting cards or your defense cards. And they just kind of sit on the board. It's a really simple, fast game. Yeah, I want to say that it's certainly not like Seven Wonders and yeah. Dara because it's weird. Yeah, it's... Now, I've only played it one time, and this yeah. is over a year ago, so yeah. I don't remember that well. I remember liking it, yeah. but then not getting it back out to explore it a bit more. And there's an expansion for it, which just adds uh, another pile of cards to it, which is all. That's always a good expansion, where it's just here's some more cards. They do the same thing as the cards you have, uh, so the game's the same. It just gives you a little more, diff, uh, you know, randomness to it of what you're going to mm-hmm. end up drawing. Uh, the art in it is very simplistic. I mean, it has a weird look to it. Isn't it kind of a stained glass? Yeah, stained glass. Well, I mean, paper. All like people look like paper on stained glass kind of look to it. Uh, it's, it so it has a very visual look to it when you're playing it. Uh, again, it's it's super easy, uh, and it's and it's fast. So when you're playing it, it's not you're not going to take a long time. You play it a couple times, uh, but. For the passing the cards around, drafting part of the game, and put it playing the cards down on what you're going to do, I it was just such a simple mechanic that I really, really enjoyed it. And and I, like I said, I did the pup meeble thing, and as I was going through, I'm like, yeah, paper tails, paper tails it was good. Uh, so my 25 is paper tails. It's it's not it's stronghold games. I can I can see it from here, uh, but it's. I don't see it a lot of places, so maybe it's not in print. I don't know. I don't. I don't, low I don't print run I don't, or something. I never see it, and I never hear anybody talking about it. But um, <clears throat> on the shelf, it kind of pops a little bit. So I mean, if you find it, pick it up. It's good. <coughs> My twenty-four is going to be higher on your list. Uh, Spoilers! Come on, man. Uh, this was one of those games where when we were playing it, we all kind of went in like, eh. And we played it the first time, and we were like, holy crap, that was a really good game. It was better than all the games with that guy's name on it. And he didn't even make it. He just approved it. Uh, it's Lowlands, an Uwe Rosenberg game, but he... he uh, whatever, he put his stamp of approval on it? Because mm-hmm. it kind of uses his mechanisms. It feels very Agricola. 
Yeah. With extra mechanics. Uh, so Lowlands is a it's a Euro game. It's like a lot of other Uwe Rosenberg games, and I can't remember the name of the guy who made it. I can't either. Right it used to sit. Ha ha. Uh, C and R Partenheimer. Partenheimer. So, uh, game looks boring as all f. Game looks <laughs> just bland as could be. It, boy, yeah, this looks boring as all hell. Uh, but it, it's like all of his other games. Well, it's like all of the other similar games right. to that. So you have a little farm in front of you, but in this game you're only farming sheep. And that's it. Uh, and so your sheep are on the board, but there's also a water thing that you're trying to build a wall in front of. So the water doesn't come over to your lowlands and wash away your sheep. So you're building up your farm area <laughs> in the lowlands, right? That's, yeah. This is your this is your area that if yeah. you ever played Agricola, this is your same. It's like yeah. your pasture where you're going to put up your fences and you're yeah. going to like herd your <laughs> animals in a certain way. In this case, just sheep. But uh, you're doing all of this here, but you're doing it in an area that can flood. So everybody at the table right. should be, in theory, Helping. working on building a dike that will stop the water from coming in when it rises. Yeah. If too many people are working on the dike, like building it too high, too fast... One guy it, is... Well, the other puts, people are just going to be building sheep. Then it puts emphasis <laughs> on the score of the sheep yeah. because uh, all your resources are going into the dike... Therefore, your sheep population should be lower, so the person who's making the most of them is, is gaining the most out of it. Right. However, if everybody's working on their sheep and ignoring the dike, everybody's land is about to get destroyed, so the person who puts the most emphasis on working on the dike is actually going to score more points as a scale that moves back right. and forth depending on how far the dike is built in, in the rounds. Right. It's ingenious. Yeah, it's it's great. It, it's it a is, genius. Uh, so, Agricola was good. Caverna was better. Yeah, and this is kind of the it was better, but it's it, taking a different route, right? Instead of expanding into this whole other area, right? It's still focused on the one thing, um, but then it adds an addition that's still all about that like one that one thing. It still all ties back to like the farm. It's really, it's really good because you, uh, yet alone that you, you get a lot of table talk in the game. Because you're like, you're like, you're not helping at all with the dike. Yeah. Uh, and it's like we're not, we're gonna stop working on the dike altogether, and all your sheep are gonna go away. <laughs> we're just gonna let that water roll right over. And uh, so, it is. It's, a, it's a balancing act of putting enough into the dike and also making enough sheep that at the end you hit that. You hit that sweet spot, which is a thing I I like in games, which will come up later in a couple other games. Uh, I like I like the, the a game a game that has a balance. So that's my problem with Seven Wonders is if one person just collects up all the science, they win. Right. There's no there's, there's no sliding scale. Right. There's no sliding scale for that. To adjust for, for those kinds of I things. I can't collect something else. I have to collect science cards to even that out. Right. I have to hate draft. In Lowlands, at no point, everybody kind of knows I have to work on the dike, but I also have to make sheep. But I have to keep an eye on the other people to make sure they're not overproducing sheep just a little bit and underproducing on the dike just a little bit, which is going to give them that multiplier at the end, which is going to give them the win. Or, or going, you can go the other yeah, way. Yeah, or the other well. way. So, so yeah. So my number, and I think, I'm pretty sure it's going to be higher on your list, but number 24 is low lands. All right. Number 24 for me is uh, Grand Austria Hotel. Ooh. You might have to help me out with this because I've only played, like, so good. a kitted out yeah. version here where we actually have the like full on Oh, stuff. the cheesecake and all that, yeah. Yeah, so you are collecting items Yeah. Um, and some of the items I think I was playing with were slightly different than the ones that are in the box because somebody has like a custom uh, pieces um, 
That's the one. Um, so you are running a hotel. You're putting in rooms, and you're trying to convince people to come stay in those yep. rooms and satisfy their expectations while they're there. So you're uh, collecting the guys, which will help give you resources. Uh, you're getting staff members that will also help you either one time, here's a big thing of resources, right. or, or every, every round, round they'll give you something. Here's the thing they can churn out. Yeah. Um, and then you're using those resources to pull the guests and have them stay in uh, properly colored rooms, if I remember yep. correctly. Green is wild. Re re uh, doors are red, yellow, and blue. Green is wild. Right. So, uh, so you're doing, and you're doing this all with, uh, a dice draft that happens, where all the dice get rolled. Again, parts, ass. <laughs> Again, we're, we're, we're in the, we're in the silly stage. <laughs> See, here's the thing that's gonna happen. We're gonna go through the silly stage of art, and then, but with these yeah. strong games, and spoiler alert, the games yeah. that are gonna sit above them are gonna be, like, the same designers. Yeah. Uh, same style games, same type of mechanics. Yeah. But then they went out and were like, you know, what happens if we just <laughs> throw money at, like, real good artists? Yeah. What if we uh, make things Sorry to whoever made Grand Austria Hotel. Unfortunately, I can also make that, and I wouldn't put it on a box. Art's not the best. Um, but yeah, it's mechanically, like, it all just sort of fits. This game's um, awesome. Thematically, it all... So, uh, I completely missed the part where I was talking about the dice. So all the dice get thrown out, and then the dice... The numbers correspond to, like, an action, right? So those numbers get placed out onto the actions, and then the amount of dice that are there determines sort of how much of the action you can do. Yeah. So, of course, you're trying to collect, you know, big chunks of an action when you can, but also that might not be the action that you need currently, but you don't want to leave it there for the next person to have all that extra amount available. So your choices feel very, like, extremely impactful every turn um everything fits like mechanically it all seems to i don't know which came first on here the theme or the mechanic um because they put it together gotta really the, well gotta be the mechanic you would think yeah but uh i you know i can't tell but yeah. that's just a good that's just yeah. a, a, a good uh proof that they yeah. that they integrated or incorporated it all really well um just another one of those like chunky euros where you got to do a little bit of the math. Yeah. Um, now it's a game where you can get screwed. You can get screwed true. by the by the people that come out that you can bring to your your tables. Right. You can start with right. the wrong setup. Right. You can start with a very good setup for one type of card that just doesn't decide to show up. Right. Um, but even then, you still have choices. You still have ways mm -hmm. to get around that. A lot of that has to do with the dice drafting. Um. So no part of the the game isn't like doesn't lean on one part harder than the other for for where your like points come from. Again, it doesn't. We also really like dice drafting. We tend I tend to like drafting, yeah. and I tend to like worker placement. Yeah. And this one doesn't have the worker placement so much, right? <laughs> but the drafting is heavy. Yeah, it's good. So we're Grand, gonna be talking about it later. Grand Austria Hotel and my number twenty three. <laughs> Is a spiritual successor to Uwe Rosenberg's <laughs> Ricola line. We're not going to talk about it because we just did. My number 23 is Lowlands. Lowlands! And I was like, oh, it's one off. <laughs> so close. But 23, once again, Lowlands, yeah. liked the sheep, liked all the stuff, the farming, yeah. uh, in games like Agricola. This one, again, extra component. They added something that fits, it fits with the theme. It creates a different balance to the game, so it feels like a different game. It's not the same thing. But I would yeah. argue, since I already, I think I talked about Agricola. No, I talked about Caverna. Yeah, you talked about Caverna. I didn't put Agricola on here because, again, it's not quite there. This is the thing that jumps it up into my list. Yeah. So, number 23 was going to be, or is, uh, Lowlands. Lowlands, so good. All right, so my 23... Uh, is going to be uh, a game that I'm going to pat myself on the back on. I don't think I've ever lost. I have played it a whole crap load of times. I don't think I have ever lost. And that is Dice Forge. Yeah, well... <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever lost. I hate you for your luck. <laughs> yeah. <Come on. laughs> uh, 
but Dice Forge, it's right here, uh, and there's an expansion for it, which is really good, um, is a game where you're buying pieces of your dice. So your dice start out normal like everybody else's. You're buying the faces of, of the, the dice. dice. So you actually use the pieces of the, the thing to plick, plick off the side of your dice and put a new piece on. And that makes your dice better than the guy next to you, or different than the guy next to you, depending on what way of point salad mechanism you're going to go to try to win the game. Because uh, you can put gold, you can put points, you can put the uh, the red and blue energy, which is allows you to buy stuff and buy stuff on the board. Cause now, you... This is one that I will say feels very point salad -y yeah. because you're drafting and normally in a drafting game you go through a deck so it's only a matter of time before you see that thing right but in this one you can put a die <laughs> side on there and then literally never and see never that roll side it. come up as yeah. i have uh proven time and again because i love this game but whatever my best die is you will never see that side show up ever it's good so uh you haven't mentioned dice forge yet right Nope. No, it's coming up. Uh, so, uh, Dice Forge, uh, it's it's a dice building game. But then you roll, and you can either, on your turn, everybody gets something. It's one of those games where everybody gets something on their turn. Or on anybody's turn, as I remember. Yeah, everybody rolls uh, each turn. Each turn. Uh, so, so. But they don't get to take the actions, they just get the stuff on their dice. And the guy whose turn it is actually gets to do right. the two actions. So you're building your pool yeah. the whole round right. as the dice come back to you, and then expending most of your pool on your turn, on your turn uh, uh, which will allow you to buy other dice. Uh, faces to or, increase the power of your dice or go to the board or buy cards move. from the board um and it has a cool function where if somebody else is on the space you're going to and you bump them they go back to their home the home space but then they get to roll their dice which is whatever it's called uh praying or something and they get to roll their dice once and get whatever they roll Right, it's really no negative uh, for them because you know, right. they've already it's been there. Good they've already sometimes. taken the action, so yeah. they're really just getting something for doing that. But a lot of the cards will then offset that by giving you something for pushing people off of spaces. Yeah. So you use the cards to sort of uh, equal out some of the things that you can't do with your dice, yeah. or to enhance the things you are doing with your dice. It just depends right. on how you're building. I think we're going to talk about this one later. So twenty three is dice well, forge. Small spoilers, we won't talk about it on this list. Oh! We will get there. Okay, so Dice Forge is 23. My number 22 is my top roll and write. Okay. So 22 is a newer game. Uh, Fleet the Fleet Dice Game. Fleet the Dice Game, Fleet the Dice game is... It's just awesome. For 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 a roll and write, it's I a, am amazed. <laughs> this is not in at least your top 20, I, let alone at, the top 10. I mean again, it's I mean, so new. 10, I mean again, it's 10. almost in my top 20. It's 22. It's close. Uh there's so many good games. Um it will probably make its way in there. It is It helped that I forgot Endeavor. It's going to yeah. it's gonna, it's gonna get it's here. So Fleet the Dice game is you you get two sheets of paper instead of one, and you put them together, and you're you basically roll dice for fish because you're going to go fishing, and then after everybody's done that, and they've pick, you pick one dice, and then everybody picks a dice, and then it leaves one dice left over, and everybody gets that. So like shrimp, everybody gets a shrimp, and you're just marking it on your sheet, just like Yahtzee trying to, and any other roll, right, where you're trying to fill up boxes, yeah, on your sheet. And then, the, there's a, then there's a second round of dice. And it, by the way, you can get a dice tower that looks like a, a lighthouse that it's comes with it. It's goofy. It's goofy, but it's awesome. And um, and so in that one, then you go to town, 
and you roll these dice when you go to town. You're basically that's, choosing what to do while you're in right. town. And then there's buildings, and, and there's the wharf, and there's... Uh, you go to the uh, market, you can you, sell fish Yeah, you there. go to market and just get money. Yeah, you can... Um, Depending on what rolls. Right. Uh, it is the most complex... Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, Roll and write yeah. that exists thus far. Uh, there was one similar, but there's, just not as good. There's The thing about Fleet the Dice game is if you're not paying attention to what you've marked off, you're going to miss some big scores. Because people will forget that Your every time you go fishing, you get to do something else. And every time you do this, depending on how many boats you have, you get to do this. Your turns in the later rounds, the amount of chaining that yeah. happens if you pick the right die is yeah. crazy. Like, yeah. you're just marking... At first, you're just marking one yeah. thing here and one thing here. Okay, there's right. two... There's two st- and then later on, you're like, well, if I pick this dice, I'm going to mark this here, and then two over here, and then right. this thing back over here for marking, <laughs> completing that thing. And then every, like... As it goes, it gets a little wider. I think it's every five gold, you get a wild... And that allows you to mark something off on your sheet. And then uh, in the later rounds, I think it might be every 10 or something. But yeah, those wilds add up after a while of getting free marks on your sheet. Uh, and then at the end, it's just you take every bit of each sheet and you add it all up. Like, how many fish did you fish? And then you add up all the fish, 74. And uh, yeah, it's far and above. I've gotten rid of, I've gotten rid of a lot of rolling rights. I might not even have very many rolling rights on my list. I think Welcome To and and this might be my only rolling rights in my top 100. I, but, oh, uh, that's pretty clever. It's on my list, too. It's gone chunk clever. Um, I I love rolling rights. They're super easy to play. And as long as somebody's played Yahtzee, it's kind of easy to explain. Yeah, generally. Yeah. So, uh, my 22 is Fleet the Dice Game. Yeah. (laughs) All right, that leaves me with 22. Yeah. 22 is a two-part drafting and auction game. Uh, Number 22 is Biblios. No. Um, So, as you play Biblios, the first part of the game is you get a hand of X amount of cards. Um, You will choose as they come up where those cards are going to go. You don't see them all at the same time. You're just going to draw them out. So in a three-person game, you're going to see four cards. You're going to draw the first one. You're going to decide if that goes to you, if it goes to one of your opponents, or if it goes to the auction pile for the end of the game. You are trying to collect um, sets of cards Mm -hmm. with high numbers. So they're colored, and then the colors each have a number of cards like one through five yep five is let's suck at this game five is worth more uh than you know four three two um but whoever has the most of that type of card at the or that color at the end of the game will get points equal to a dice of that same color that's out however that dice can be shifted up and down yep. uh throughout the game based on cards that pop up and I do not love that. I necessarily love that even by you. Again, the card yeah. comes up, and then you choose, is this my card to affect the dice? Is this going to one of my opponents to affect the dice? And hopefully they don't move down one that I'm trying to collect, uh, and you know up ones that are better for them. Uh, or does it go to the, uh, the discard pile, the auction pile for the end of the game? Because some of the, di- or some of the cards have uh, money on them. And at the end of the game... You will use money to draft cards that do not have money on them. Yeah. And you will use cards to draft money cards. Because you can then use that money for later rounds to purchase more stuff. So, you draft all the way till till the deck is gone. Everybody now has their hand of cards. They now have kind of an idea of the things that they're looking for. Whether it's one of the colors... Um, or, or which colors in particular they're going to try to go after and then you move to the second part of the game which is the auction of the deck that was left over uh, from the first round once that is done you will then total up who has the most of each color 
they will get points based on uh, dice that are out that that are the same color they correspond um, and then the person with the most points wins super low scoring game pretty fast game considering what you're doing there's a bunch of steps like along the way there's a lot of choices that you're making that's suck at it <laughs> and Hugh sucks at it I so do. of course I love it yeah um, I suck at that game yeah, this is a game that there's a bit of luck in, like, the cards that you draw on your turn, but it's not a very luck-dependent game, right? You are making a lot of the choices about what well, you see. Well, there's gambling, there's gambling involved, where you're like, I'm going to go for red, and then while you're going for red, everybody's driving the number down on red, so at the end of the game, red's worth two. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, it's not really it's not really mm. gambling because it's not like a roll of the dice on whether that was good or not. You'll right. know as actions happen like whether you're in a good spot or not. Like you, you're determining. Yeah. I mean that is not determined by a random like roll of the die. Uh, press your luck games. I suck at because my luck sucks. Love they just press your luck. I just get thrown out of rounds. Mm. This is a game that I do pretty good at. <laughs> Uh, because you're playing odds, and I, I'm, I'm a bit better with those. Um, couldn't tell you what it's about, really. Like, what the story's supposed to be in the game. Yeah, you know, no, there is like a, a monk, thing. monk on the front cover. Yeah, um, art's not particularly attractive. It's not a game that I would think stands out. It's not a game that I would just pick up on my own. That's a game I will not be shocked if it gets reskinned. Yeah, yeah, me either. Yeah. But, um... But somebody else had me play this one, and that's how I end up with these games that I think look bland. Damn you, Nathan. <laughs> uh, but but then you get to play it, and you're like, oh, wow. They, you know, it's really strong. I like the setup. So, uh, number 22, yep. Biblios. Number 21, we talked about the uh, successor to this game already. But now we're going back. This is Castles. Of Mad King Ludwig. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> we talked about uh, between, between two, two castles, castles of Mad, Mad King, King Ludwig, Ludwig right. which uses castles of right. Mad King Ludwig, which I think is overall it's a slightly better game, and Between Two Cities, which is a game that I did not like on its own. Yeah. I thought castles really drug that one up. Um, and, and the, I mean, that's because of the castle stuff, the zaniness of castle that existed. Mm -hmm. This one is the zaniest yep. of all of them. Um, you are building a castle, uh, but your ca the rooms that you have to choose from come <laughs> in all shapes and sizes. And you have to be able to... Bid on them. Well, you, for, you have to bid on them to, to actually uh, get the uh, rooms that you want. But on top of that, the rooms have to fit together, and doors have to attach to doors and other rooms to put them on. And we're talking, some of the pieces are literally circles. Yeah, circles. Um, so you're doing a guessing game of whether certain pieces will fit in certain right. areas as you're making it. It's never structured like very well. Like it's never in like a little neat square. It's right. always going all over the board. I believe it's actually in the rules that basically like. If it's gonna run into somebody else's castle, you can't put it there because like their castle already inhabits that mm -hmm. spot. Because you're just making this weird zooming off in the mm -hmm. space uh, castle layout, and then on top of that, the rooms are uh, colored, uh, and those colors uh, and determine there, and there's other things just written on the thing that says. Yeah, so some of them have you points. You can't put this next to this. Some of them have just straight up points. Some of them have bonus powers. Some of them say you're not allowed to attach a certain type of yeah. room to it. Um, and then on top of that, there's bonuses for... Uh, Putting other types of rooms on it. Getting all of the doors... Right. Uh, covered. Covered. Yeah. So that they all lead into different areas. And then there's uh, additional stuff with... Uh, upstairs versus downstairs where certain rooms can only exist on a lower yep. floor that's just indicated by a staircase that you add in the game um you buying generic hallways just to give yourself an out to try to have more room to like work with and grow it's very zany yeah we're gonna be talking about this one in here in just a little bit huh yeah yeah, yeah. crazy uh i will say one thing though about castles mad kid language they tried to uh, 
people compared it to what? Suburbia? Yes. Suburbia, and a lot of people like Suburbia. I, I hate Suburbia. And then they tried to take Castle of Mad King and Ludwig and make Palaces of Mad King Ludwig. Which I still haven't played to this which day, was I don't know that much about Which that. was all right, but they turned all the pieces into squares. So it felt a little bit like Suburbia. And I was just like, I am with you. I like the goofiness of the tile pieces. Yeah, I mean, that's really what sort of makes yeah. the game for me. So I will say that there was a point where I thought Suburbia was probably the better game because, like, mechanically it all seemed like it fit together really well. Yeah. Um, but it takes out that part of the game where you're doing the... Let me add, let me add what that thing is. Fun. <laughs> takes away the fun. Um, God, Suburbia is so boring. Uh, I, I like Suburbia. It's not in my top 100, though. And, and Castles, that extra component of like the weird rooms and like playing so we like the tetris games we right. like the polyomino games right but those again are also all made to fit together in some way right these are not well the other thing about castles of mad king ludwig is the fact that it has that uh i choose how much something's gonna cost you get to pick first right so it's that level of me trying to put out the thing that i need for my board in the right area where you won't buy it. <laughs> but I'll make enough money off of you to buy it myself. Right, yeah. So, yeah, I, I like that game. Um, yeah, so the, the auction component works really well in it. Uh, the the building of the, of the actual board, like, as you're going, your building of your castle is different than almost every other game where it's, like, it's trying to be compact and yep. fit, like, neatly in this area. And this game just, like, nah, let's yeah. just... Go everywhere. Yeah. Let's be goofy. Um, and, and then, yeah, the, all the points sort of work out really well in the, like, trying to close down your things and activate your powers. Yeah. And nobody seems to really, that, that I can remember, like, run away with it in such a, like, crazy... But you can clearly see a castle that was working, like, better. Like, they were getting a better shake at making a, a castle that works versus you. Uh, and now I'm just wondering where an expansion is that has, like, triangle pieces to go <laughs> yeah. with it. Um, yeah, number 21, Castle Night King Ludwig. Okay, my 21 is the weirdest game in my top 100. Joel knows what it is. Uh, James Clavell Shogun the Card Game. <laughs> well, it had to show up somewhere. And, uh, I, luckily I have it right This here. is the only place it's gonna show up, because you can't find it. Uh, so, this is James Clavell's Shogun the Card Game. It's kind of a poker game, but yeah. has bad cards like Old Maid that can end up in your hand that can screw you over. And the goal of the game is just to have the best hand at the end of the round. Uh, there's two passes in the game, so no matter how many people are playing, it plays three to eight, so the more people, the better. Uh, when you're playing it, I, could, I flip the card over from the card flipper, and it's just a numbered card. Yellow cards are higher than the other card, the green cards or whatever they are. And I give it, and I flip the card over, but I flip it over to this person next to me. And that person can go, I'm, I'm going to take that one and put it in my hand. Or they can go, nah, I'm going to pass it. So it goes to the next person. And then the next person has the decision of, yeah, and you have a down card also, so you, and nobody knows what that is. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to keep that one. Or they can go, I'm going to pass it. Now, unfortunately, for the number three schmuck at the table, he just gets That's stuck with That's now their it. card. That's just now their card. They don't get another pass. So there's two passes, and the third guy has to keep. And you just keep going until everybody has five cards in front of them. Now, there are a couple funny cards that can kill your whole hand. There's an assassin card that somebody can have and they can use uh, on somebody if they think they have a perfect hand. This is the Buddha card that's, I think, worth nothing unless another card Right, shows another card with, with it. it. And, uh, I mean, there's there's not a lot to the game. Uh, but it is my favorite card game. Where this is, this is all it is. I don't... It's out of print. I mean, you're talking about a game made about a 1970s TV miniseries. Or book, because it was James Clavell's book. But the... Cards all have pictures from the 1970s TV and series. It shows. <laughs> and uh, uh, it is 
it is a great game. If you can get a copy on eBay or something, grab it. It's friggin' phenomenal. Uh, so, uh, I know I'm probably the only person on the planet who puts this in their top 100 games of all time. Oh, you are. I've asked uh, everyone. <laughs> so, my number 21 is James Clavell's Shogun, the card game. Now, I have to always say it that way because there are like... There's plenty of Shogun there's out there. Yeah. ten different games called Shogun. So if I go, oh yeah, I love Shogun. They're like, oh yeah, I like Shogun too. That's a good game. Yeah, the one, the one with the minis. Yeah, the, the one with the, the minis. Or... The other one, like Axis and Allies. No, the no. one about the 70s <laughs> show that you yeah. also don't remember. Right. So James Clavell's Shogun the card game. My number Did 21. you purposely fiddle with your list to make sure it was a, a number one on some <laughs> list somewhere? <laughs> James, Cl if it was games people don't know about, this is uh, my number, number one. one. This number is my number one. one. So, um, yeah, the mechanics work well yeah. in it. I've played great. it quite a few times too. You're just trying to make runs or sets. There's sort of two different levels of uh, mm -hmm. cards. Easier to make runs and High sets cards, on the low, low cards. cards. Yeah. Much more difficult to complete a full hand on the top end. Yeah. Um, the way the mechanic work is, is just a precursor to uh, things like Abyss. Yeah. Um, with the with the pass or draft mm -hmm. around the whole table, uh, kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's yeah. fun. It's not ever gonna be in my <laughs> top one hundred. There's gonna be that one day where I make one and I'm just like, eh. I'm gonna throw it in there. Hughes right. <laughs> number one hundred. <laughs> <laughs> James Clavell's Shogun. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I, yeah. I only say if you can find a copy at a thrift store or wherever you can find it now. Yeah, if you find a copy for $150, I don't recommend this game. <laughs> yeah, that's a little pricey. If you find one for $10, I recommend this game. Uh, back in the day, I bought a couple copies off of eBay. When I first, that copy I bought off eBay for 20 bucks. That was a long time ago, though. Uh, so, yeah, that's my number 21. So. That completes our list of 30 to 21. That is, yeah, 30 through 21. Getting very close now. Yep. Getting very close. But there's another list or two to go, and this one is hot garbage. <laughs> so show up next time when we knock out 20 through 11. The real good stuff on the Draft House Top 100. I'm Joel. I am Hugh. We'll catch you next time. All right.